we've got a couple news items for this week's hardware news recap. So this is everything that's happened in the past week. And this is leading into Computex, which means we're about to hit a period of the season where it is the most hardware news as rapidly as possible. For this past week, we've got the GT 1030 to talk about, which is NVIDIA's response to the RX 550, AMD Vega stuff, Swift Tech, and lots of cooling solutions, and some stuff in the memory GDDR6 department. We'll get through all of that in today's Hardware News Recap. Before getting to that, this coverage is brought to you by Corsair's new T1 race chair, which is a $350 gaming targeted chair using a bucket style race seat. The chair arms have four directional movement for configuration to your liking, and as a bonus, they use rollerblade wheels. Learn more at the link in the description below. Starting off with some Computex information before getting to the video cards and other coverage, Computex is a show that as of last year, we're going to regularly now. So we'll be there again this year. We're leaving this week within days of filming this, if not sooner. And uh, we'll be covering all of the newest trends and products at the show. So if you're not subscribed, do it now. That way you can catch everything. Computex is the biggest trade show. It's bigger than CES for us in the hardware space. And that means lots of new stuff, lots of stuff that will never make it to market and prototypes and all kinds of things like that. So stay tuned for that. But for the last week of news, the GT 1030 is the first thing we're going to open with. So NVIDIA somewhat quietly released the 1030, and this was in response to AMD's RX 550, which we haven't yet reviewed, but we've got one in now, finally. So 1030 is a response to that. It is a budget card. It is less than $100. They tend to be in the $70 to $80 range. And uh, because of their low power output, low thermal concerns, all of that kind of thing, the GT 1030s are capable of shipping in half height or uh, smaller form factors. And some of them, at least one that we've seen so far, are passively cooled because they aren't hot enough to really need a fan as long as case airflow is decent. So that makes them really interesting for many ITX builds, small form factor boxes, HTPCs, things like that. 1030 is pretty low power though, as you would expect. 384 CUDA cores on it. The boost clock natively is at 1468 megahertz without any modification, two gigabyte memory, so pretty limited there as well. Uh, and it's mostly a, it is entirely a partner launch. So all AIB cards ones to look out for include EVGA, Inno3D, MSI, Asus, Gigabyte, Pallet, and Zotac. They've all got cards out already. The MSI one so far is the only one we've seen that is passively cooled that's in stock. So that's interesting to look at. We'll, we'll see about that. Uh, otherwise, half height is really the main selling point. For gaming, if you're actually just gaming and that's all you care about, it's better to bump up a step to something like a 560 or a 1050 if you can afford it rather than getting saving 10, 20 bucks and getting one of these because the power difference in terms of gaming ability will be tremendous and the price difference doesn't necessarily make up for it. But if you have a specific use for something like a 1030, it's out there now. We'll try and review one, but it's not high on the list because uh, it's a low end part and we've looked at a couple of those already. So stay tuned for more though. Last week, we discussed the details of AMD's Financial and Analyst Day or hashtag AMDFAD on Twitter. We covered all of it in a separate video or well, most of it anyway, except for some of the Radeon or uh, Ryzen Pro coverage. But the biggest news items were the AMD Vega Frontier Edition video card, which is a data scientist targeted device and uh, Threadripper and the Epic CPUs. If you missed that coverage, check out the video and article on that, but the very basics of it to get everyone up to speed, Vega Frontier Edition was announced first. It's a data scientist card. That means it's not meant for gaming. The gaming stuff for Vega is TBD, probably July or later. July or August is seeming the most realistic based on industry trends for this type of launch because they normally push enterprise business B2B type stuff first. So that's the news with Vega. Gaming TBD, that's the takeaway here. There were some demos though, we talked about those in the original content. Threadripper is AMD's likely i9 competitor, the Intel i9 that we talked about last week. Uh, so that's Threadripper. It will be a, uh, an enthusiast HEDT type of CPU with Epic being, that's E-P-Y-C, being a server grade CPU. And we talk about all of that in that coverage. Swift Tech is now offering two water blocks for the GTX 1080 Ti Founders Edition card or AIB cards using the FE PCB. Both blocks are machined from chrome plated copper and acrylic, but differ in cosmetics. The Komodo NV-LE features an aluminum backplate with an included RGB strip, 
while the Komodo NV Eco is a more basic block without the aforesaid accessories. Additionally, Swift Tech offers two new SLI crossfire bridges to be paired with the new water blocks. Like the blocks, the bridges come in both an LE and an Eco option. And speaking of Swift Tech, there's a lot of cooling news this week as seems to be the trend lately. EK has a new gaming series of liquid cooling solution options in a box. They're basically calling it a loop in a box. So this is a full open loop. It is sort of uh, baby's first open loop is the goal here. They're trying to set a lower price point so that it competes with the expensive CLCs, something like a Kraken X62 would be in direct price competition to some of the cheaper AI or full open loops in the gaming series from EK. They've got 280 models, they have a couple others as well, and these kits are making use of empty five and a quarter inch bays, so you can install some of the components in those, which is a nice use of those since no one messes with five and a quarter anymore. And they also include uh, all of the water blocks that you would need. So a universal water block, which includes AM4 support. They've got a plexiglass reservoir that requires two five and a quarter bays if you've got them, which a lot of people do, and two meters of clear tubing that you can cut to size based on the loop. The EK gaming series includes a 100 milliliter bottle of what they call cryo fuel or basically mineral oil, six compression fittings, and the reservoir also has an integrated D5 PWM pump, which is one of the more popular ones on the market. And that cryo fuel concentrate needs to be diluted with distilled water, but they've supplied everything you need to get started. And the radiator size comes in 240, 280, and 360 millimeters, including two or three fans, depending on rad size. Noctua, meanwhile, has announced new 200 millimeter, 120 millimeter, and 40 millimeter fans this week, in addition to a new fan controller, anti-vibration mount, and SATA power adapter. The new 120 millimeter model fan is 10 millimeters thinner than a standard 120 mil fan and is designed for water cooling where space is limited. The 40 millimeter fan has conversely seen its thickness increased for deployment in high pressure applications like routers and DVRs. And the new SATA power adapter permits a four pin to SATA connection so fans can be run straight from a PSU. The new controller, meanwhile, accommodates three four pin fans and is manually controllable. You can check Noctua's website for pricing, availability, and more information on that. Building upon the existing design of the original H7, CryoRig's redesign includes an extra heat pipe as well as rearranging heat pipes to better absorb heat around the CPU hotspots. The new H7 is 145mm tall, 98mm deep, and it should mitigate clearance issues for both the cases and RAM. Since a lot of the cases have a 150 millimeter height clearance and so the RAM can start bumping into things with the Z series or AM4 boards. The newer H7 runs a bolstered 160 watt TDP support up from the preceding models 140 watt TDP. Notably, the H7 Quad Lumi has RGB lighting with control via NZXT's CAM software. That's kind of noteworthy and interesting. And the cooler is compatible with both Intel and AMD sockets, including AM4, and will sell for about $60 in June. One more quick one in the cooling department. Reven will reportedly be at Computex this year. They've announced at least one product a bit early, and that's the new Kirin line. The RGB fans will offer 11 translucent blades in conjunction with RGB lighting and fit in standard 120 millimeter fan slots. These use sleeve bearings and the fans should be priced at around $17, mostly targeting the RGB craze because otherwise they're just fans. And in case news, Leon Lee has a new case that's kind of targeted at the bench market. So this is where the Core P3 really shines in being a traditional case that also works in a test bench deployment. The Leon Lee PC T70, ever with their friendly names and very usable uh, letter and number amalgams. The PCT70 and PCO12WX are the new cases to talk about. One of these is the test bench, that's the T70. And the T70 was originally shown at CES, but it's actually coming to market now. It should be available as of this video for the most part. Out of box, it's an open air bench. You can buy an additional accessory, which they have labeled the T70-1. And the T71 is what allows it to turn into a closed air bench, basically more of a standard case, but still somewhat accessible. The PCO12WX, meanwhile, is a mid tower case, a standard enclosure, and it uses Leon Lee's custom aluminum and glass construction, which they have in basically everything. Because of that, it's a bit more expensive, aluminum and glass, not really the cheapest components. And it's primarily comprised of three compartments, say that three times fast, and they've got effectively uh, different component sections within the case. So you can compartmentalize things 
which really helps more with how you're laying it out in terms of looks than anything. It's not as much of a cooling or a noise concern as it is just for looks. So those are the two new Leon Lee cases. The T70 is $190. goes back to what we said about test benches being really expensive. And the PCO12WX is $400. So uh, it's Leon Lee. That's just what they do. A couple more quick ones in the peripheral department. Rocket's got their new leader mouse available for pre-order with owl eye sensors shipping in the mice. The CES 2017 event from Rocket is where we first saw that owl eye sensor, as they call it. That's a collaboration with PixArt, one of the most prolific sensor makers right now, that resulted in a modified PixArt 3360 sensor, which is now called the PixArt 3361. The sensor is shipping in three of Rocket's mice, the Leader, the Cone EP, and the Cone Pure 2017. And moreover, the wireless Leader is now available for pre-order via Rocket's website, and that's 140 bucks. So that lines up all of the new mouse announcements that we've seen lately, including Corsair, Razer, and now Rocket. Also in peripherals, there's a new Acer Predator Z35P display that was announced and shown. It's an 8-bit, 35-inch AMVA panel overclocked at 120 hertz from the factory, which is 100 hertz native. The panel features an 1800R curvature and uses a 2500 to 1 contrast ratio. To round it out, the Z35P has a 4 millisecond grade to grade response time, 300 nits brightness, 100 by 100 VESA mount, and G-Sync support. And that display will cost $1,100. And the final two news items are in the storage and memory worlds. The first one that is probably the most interesting is SK Hynix's GDDR6 specifications that were posted in the past week. And those specs include information on the GDDR6 product stack that they have theoretically panning out for fourth quarter of 2017 for the manufacturers to start deploying in their products. That may be something like Volta. It could be other things as well, but we'll find out closer to fourth quarter 2017. The new memory will have an eight gigabyte capacity and it offers data rates of 14 gigatransfers per second with a 1.35 operating voltage. Not too different from what we've seen now, uh, but some changes overall. As we roll through the rest of summer, we should learn more about this memory and the new spec as GDDR6 is still brand new. And then finally, Western Digital is expanding the capacity of its NAS-oriented hard drives with Helium, allowing them to fit more platters inside the hard drive chassis. WD Red and Red Pro series now offer a 10 terabyte option, both with 256 megabytes DRAM cache. And the consumer-oriented WD Red uses a 5400 RPM motor. A three-year warranty is offered with that, and it costs $494 now. Meanwhile, the WD Red Pro is 7200 RPM for the motor, and has a five-year warranty. So that's your primary difference with what WD calls, quote, advanced vibration protection technology, which is just kind of what all these drive vendors use to differentiate their high and low end lines. WD Red Pro, 533 bucks, so a bit more. And that rounds out the news. So as always, you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net to buy shirts exactly like this one. We've got cottons in stock and uh, subscribe for Computex because that'll be big for us. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all next time.